molecules, the shapes of molecules, the kinds of bonds. The next thing that that scientists or chemists wanted to understand was like, well, how do you know how much of a substance you have? So if you have a cup of pure water, how do you know how many particles those are? How do you know how it's related to the size of each of the atoms in the formula? So they came up with a counting number that is called the mole. And I don't know, like, I'm not really sure how somebody said, let's call it that. But maybe it's because it sounds like a short version of molecule. Maybe that's how it ended up coming up with its name. So the mole, by definition, is sort of like a dozen. So it was a way for them to be able to count a group of atoms. Because remember that when we're talking about atoms, they're so, so small. So if we want to have a measurable amount, we know that we have a lot of particles because of just how small they are. So two things that the mole sort of stands for. So one mole of anything is equal to its gram formula mass. So this could be the mass of an at, of based on just like an element or it could be a compound. So if I have one mole of carbon atoms, so these are just individual carbon atoms not formed into a compound or combined in any way, just single carbon atoms, if I measure out a mole of them, it will be equal to the formula mass of carbon on the periodic table. So if you look at the periodic table, when you see carbon, number above is the six, number below is that 12.01. That's its atomic mass. Remember the larger number is the atomic mass. So you just take the atomic mass, round it to a whole number, so in other chemistry classes, you keep all those decimals for us. We're just going to round it to a whole number, and we will use that. So that will equal 12 grams. So that was if I just had just pure carbon atoms. If I measure out 12 grams, then I'm going to say that is one mole of carbon. But then if I have a compound, so if I have one mole of water molecules, I can figure out how many grams that is just based on the formula for water. So again, if you look at the periodic table, find the atomic mass of hydrogen, round it to a whole number, multiply it times two because the formula says I have two of them. So I have two hydrogens and each one weighs how much? One. So that means hydrogen is going to contribute two grams Oxygen, I have one of them, and each one of these weighs 16. Just round it to a whole number is the easiest. So that'll add 16 grams. I have to add those together. So I'm just adding up the masses of each of the atoms in the formula. So I know that there's 18 grams in one mole. So I could figure out how many in two moles, I could figure out how many in five moles, I could figure out how many in 0 .008 moles. All I would need to use is I'm really just going to use this like a unit conversion. So I know one mole is equal to 18 grams. So if I set it up, if I start with grams and I want to know moles, I can do a unit conversion to go from moles to grams. If I start with moles and I want to go to grams, I can set it up as a unit conversion as well. And it's just like a single step type of unit conversion. So if I have 0 0.6 moles of water, and I want to know how many grams. So 0 0.65 moles of water is equal to how many grams? When you see moles and grams, you know you need to use what they call the formula mass. So that is just the mass of each atom in the formula added up. So... Here's what I know, here's what I want to know. So see how it looks like the unit conversions that we were doing before. So I would just put 0 0.65 moles. That's the information or what my given unit is times in a line. What unit goes on the bottom? Moles, because remember, whatever's on the top, I got to put it on the bottom in that first step because I want them to cancel. So moles will go on the bottom. But in this one, the answer I want is in what unit? grams, so grams goes on top. So now based on the formula mass, what do I put in front of grams? 18. Moles gets a 1. So I'm just using 
the number of grams in one mole as like a unit conversion to be able to convert from moles to grams. And it, this is the only, it's only one step. As long as you figure out the formula mass first, it's just like a single step. So doing the math, 0.65, and then do I multiply or divide by 18? Multiply, because it's all across the top. So I would take 0.65 times 18. See that moles and moles will cancel when I do this? The answer that I get is 11.7 grams. Now there is one thing I have to do at the end and that's figuring out if I need to round the number. So how many significant figures in my measured number? 0 0.65 has how many? Two. Mm -hmm. Remember the zero out front is not significant, just the six and the five. So that means that 11.7 has three significant figures. I need to round it to two. So what would that be? I just round it to 12, right? So I'd keep the one and the one, the next number is a seven, which means that second one would have to round up. So my answer would be that would be 12 grams. So significant figures, you do need to round them. Remember that the, the measured number is the number that you're starting with. I, you don't have to worry about like the 18 because the 18 you got from the periodic table. So the 18 you didn't measure so you always want to make sure that you use your measured number when doing the calculation so that you round it correctly. So it wouldn't matter if I had like 365 grams in a mole. I wouldn't use that 365 because that's from the periodic table. You would always use that number that you start with because that would be considered the measured number. Okay. So the other thing that they found that a mole is equal equal to, so we said that it is the molar mass or the gram formula mass. I think gram formula mass tells you better what it is. You just add up the mass of each of the atoms in the formula and it's just grams goes at the end. So they call that the molar mass or the gram formula mass. Those are saying exactly the same thing. So one mole of anything is equal to its gram formula mass but Avogadro took this whole idea and said, all right, well, let's think about how little molecules are or atoms are. How do we know in a gram formula mass, when I have 12 grams of pure carbon atoms, which is one mole, when I, if I have 12 grams of that, how many molecules is that? And then if I have 18 grams of water, how many molecules is that based on the size and the formula of those molecules, he worked out that the number of atoms in one mole of anything is this number. So that's 602 with 21 zeros after it. So this is where the exponents come in handy because that's a lot of zeros, okay? There's no decimal place, that's a period at the end, so there's no decimal place there. There's really only three significant figures in that number, the 602, all the other zeros, when you put it into scientific notation, goes away. And so it can be written easily as 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So there is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules or atoms in any, in a mole of anything. So if I have, like I said, if I have one mole of carbon atoms, I know that that would equal 12 grams. If I have one mole of carbon atoms though, that is also 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. So that's how many particles in one. So he like came up with this number between 175 and 200 years ago. So this was not something that's like been done in the most you know recent history. So as technology got better, got better, they started to look at, okay, well now we can get better ideas, better, more exact measurements. And he still is very, it was like pretty close, close enough that it has stood. So after he passed away, now this is called Avogadro's number. Everybody calls it Avocado's number, but it is Avogadro's number, just saying. Like, that's a really common mis misspelling that I hear. But that's, it got named after him because of all the, the experimentation that he did to come up with this. So the thing to remember with this 
is that one mole of anything is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles, molecules, or atoms, depending on what you're actually talking about. And one mole of anything is equal to its gram formula mass. You just add up the mass of all of the particle of all the elements in the formula. If it's just pure carbon atoms, then all we're going to have is just carbon. So it's 12 grams as its mass. So I can use Avogadro's number also as a single unit conversion. So if I have so 1.35 moles of water. And I want to know how many molecules is that? Now here is where you need to understand how to make sure that you put it in your calculator correctly. So if you see moles and grams, you need to use the formula mass. So you know you're going to have to add up all of the masses of the elements in the formula and use that. But if you see moles and molecules, then you know you just use Avogadro's number. You don't have to calculate it or anything. That's what you use. But I'm going to set it up as a single unit conversion, just like I did the other one. So I put down first 1.35 moles. And you can put H2O afterwards, or you can leave it off, either one. Try not to cap the script. 1.35 moles times and a line. What unit would I put on the bottom? Moles, because that's the one I want to get rid of. And what unit do I have to put on top? Not grams. The answer I want is molecules. Mm -hmm. The answer I want is molecules. And the numbers then, in front of molecules, I put 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. And in front of moles, I have a 1. So there's 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules in one mole of anything. Whether we're talking about water, if we're talking about carbon, if we're talking about sugar, any kind of element or compound. So now you just have to put this in your calculator correctly. Okay, so on your calculator, if you have, oh, I dropped it. <laughs> if you have the old school calculators like what I've got, and there's a couple extra, so if you didn't grab one when you came in and you're going to need to use one, I would recommend that you get one so that you know how to put it in your calculator. So in your, this calculator, now if you have a graphing calculator and you know how to put exponents in because you've always put exponents in a certain way, then just do it that way, okay? But if you have the old school calculator, look at the button under above number 7, Above number seven, there is a button that's called EE. E. It's a capital E, capital E. That button actually is times 10 to the. So you can put an exponent number in using that EE e button without having to use any kind of parentheses, without having to do any kind of like little carrots like you have to do with a graphing calculator. So what you want to put in is put 1.35. So put, put your first number in, because that's the number on the top, 1.35, and then times, then 6.02. Now I want you to hit the EE e button. Do you see two little zeros show up? Okay, those two little zeros are the exponent values, and that's when you put in 23. So put in a 2, 3. So on yours, you're going to see it looks like 6.02 with a little 23 in the upper corner. That 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Then when I hit equals, I get 8.127. And then I have a little 23 up here. If you have a graphing calculator, you probably have 8.127E23. Right? Okay. Either one, those are both correct. Those are both saying exactly the same thing. Both of those are meaning 8.127 times 10 to the 23rd. So if you have a graphing calculator and you get that E, remember that that just is referring to the exponent value that comes after the E. If you're using one of my calculators and you just see the little number kind of smaller and in the upper right corner, that's the exponent value you just add times 10 to the when you put your final answer in. Did anybody not get that hand?
Anybody that's got an old calculator? All right, so I'm just going to assume that everybody's comfortable with it. If you don't have a calculator, I very encourage you to get come up and get a calculator. There's still four in the box so that you have one to use and practice with instead of just like waiting. So am I done? So this would be molecules. So am I done? What's the last thing I got to do? Sig figs. Mm -hmm. So 1.35, how many significant figures in that number? Three. So how many significant figures in 8.127? That has four. 8.127 has four significant figures. So I've got to keep the 8.12. The next number is a seven. That rounds up or down? Up. So my answer would be 8.13 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. Remember that those exponent values, those don't count in significant figures. It's the number out front that I end up having to round. But you got to keep those numbers. Okay, so let's practice a couple. If you see moles and grams or grams and moles as in the question, so if you're given moles and you want to find grams, or if you're given grams and you want to find moles, then I know I need to use the formula mass. Okay, so if you see moles and grams, moles and grams, you're always going to need to use the formula mass. You just add up the mass of each of the atoms in the formula, and all you got to use is the periodic table. Use the bigger number, the number under the symbol, and always just round to a whole number. So for this one, if I have 1.5 moles of H2SO4 is how many grams? So I've got to first figure out the formula mass, H2SO4. So H2 is two hydrogens. Each hydrogen weighs one. So two of them weighs two. So there's two grams. Sulfur, S, weighs, find it on your periodic table. You've got to find S. Mm -hmm. So you're going to round it to a whole number, so that's 32. Since there's only one of them, I just have 32. Now oxygen weighs 16, and how many do I have? Four. So I have to take 16 times 4, that's where I get 64. So 16 and 16 is 32, and two of those things. 64. So that is where I get these numbers. From the periodic table, you look at the atomic mass, remember that's the number with the decimals, it's the bigger number on the periodic table. Hydrogen, 1.008 rounds to one times two. Sulfur, sulfur is 32.07, round it to 32, there's only one of them. Oxygen is 16.00, so it's 16 times four gives me 64. When I add those three numbers up, two plus 32 plus 64 tells me that I have 98 grams per mole. That's my unit conversion. <coughs> so I can go from moles to grams or grams to moles by using that as a unit conversion. So what do I put down first? Mm -hmm, I got to put down my 1.5 moles. And I really, I don't know what this is. I really encourage you to use the units because if you just put down 1.5, then you might forget which unit goes on the bottom because now I'm going to go times in a line what unit is always going to go on the bottom? The unit that I start with. So whatever I start with has to go on the bottom. This way, this will keep you from multiplying when you should have divided or dividing when you should multiply. So make sure you put your number and its unit times in a line. That unit goes on the bottom. The answer unit, because this is a one step, the answer I want is in grams. So grams goes on top. So the given unit goes on the bottom, the answer you want goes on top, and it's only one step. So this is the single step. But what number am I going to put in front of grams? That 98. So the reason that you figure out the formula mass is because that formula mass is now gets to be the unit conversion. 98 goes in front of grams. What goes in front of moles? One. So do you see that I have 98 grams is equal to one mole? This is going to get moles and moles to cancel and give me my answer in grams. So that's why I want you to try and make sure that you use units so that you set it up correctly each time.
So now just doing the math, 1.5 times 98. I got 147 grams. Anybody not get that? Okay, so I got 147 grams. Am I done? What do I have to do? Last thing is sig figs. 1.5, how many significant figures? Two, right? So I have two in this number. 147 has three. One, four, and seven, three significant figures. So I know I've got to round it to two. So I'm going to keep the one and the four. The next number is a seven, and that's going to cause what? It's going to round up, so the four becomes a five. So my answer is what? 150. Mm -hmm. Hold on. 150 grams. So let's look at this one. This one's still H2SO4, so it's the same compound. So I can use that formula mass. I see grams, I see moles. If you see grams and moles in the problem, then you know you need to use the formula mass. I don't have to recalculate it because it's the same one as the question above. So I can still use this one to solve it. What am I going to put down first? 50 grams times and a line. What unit goes on the bottom? Grams. Grams goes on the bottom. The given unit goes on the bottom in the every single time, right? We had to do this when you did regular unit conversions. If you started with kilograms, it always went on the bottom. If you started with milligrams, it always goes on the bottom in the first step, okay? So whatever I'm given, it goes on the bottom in the first step. What unit do I put on top? The one I want. What's my answer? Should be most. So whatever your answer unit is, that's going to go on the top because I want them to cancel. Grams and grams to cancel, leaving my answer in moles. Now, what do I put in front of moles? One. What do I put in front of grams? 98. Okay, so I'm using that formula mass. There's 98 grams in one mole or one mole over 98 grams. It's the same thing, just changing the unit of it. Grams and grams will cancel. Now I just have to do the math. So 50 divided by 98. I got 0. Point, if this thing doesn't stop falling off of here. 5102040082. Did everybody get that? That's a lot of that's a lot of exactness. <laughs> okay? So I take 50 divided by 98, because 98 is in the denominator, I get 0 0.5102048 Last thing I got to do, I can't keep all of those. How many significant figures in 50? One. Right? The zero at the end, there's no decimal, so it's not significant. That means that I've got to round this to one significant figure. So what would my answer be? <clears throat> Zero point five. Mm -hmm. So remember that the zero out front, leading zeros are never significant. It just tells you where the decimal place is. So the next first significant figure I get to is the five. Next number is a one. So all of those just get dropped off. Remember, if it's anything below five, it rounds down off or rounds down. Anything above would round that number up. So it would just be zero point five moles. Now, if you look in the problem has moles and molecules, I don't need the formula mass. All I have to use is what? Avogadro's number. Mm -hmm. So if I have moles and molecules, then I know that I use Avogadro's. Yes, I know. Avogadro's number, which is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. molecules in one mole. So I don't even have to calculate anything other than just solving this. This is the unit that I'm going to use. I don't have to like use the periodic table. If you see moles and molecules, you're going to use Avogadro's number. So I just write down what I'm given first, 1.5 moles times in a line. What unit goes on the bottom? 
And this one moles, the unit I start with, I'm given moles, so moles goes on the bottom. What goes on the top is my answer, that is molecules. So according to this, what number do I put in front of molecules? Six point zero two times ten to the twenty third, and then in front of moles, gets a one. Moles will always get the one. Grams is the formula mass. Molecules is Avogadro's number. You just have to remember which one to use. But all you've got to do really is look at the problem. If I have grams and moles, then I need the formula mass. If I see if I see moles and molecules, then I know that I need to use Avogadro's number. So now the fun of putting it in your calculator. See if you can put this in your calculator. All right, I got nine point zero three times ten to the twenty third. Anybody not get that? Hand if you didn't get it. Okay. Can I keep all those? How many significant figures in my measured number? Two. Mm -hmm. So this is two. So I can keep the 9.0. What happens to the three? It's just going to round off. So this would be 9.0 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. That's two significant figures. The 9.0 matches the significant figures in my measured number. All right, so the last page. So go ahead and do these. There's four. Moles and grams, grams and moles, moles and molecule, molecules and moles. So going back and forth in them. So this is really like the four ways that you might find this. You did. So in this, first one, what do I need to use? Three moles of CH4 is how many grams? What do I need to know first? If I see moles and grams, I need to know. The formula mass. So over here, CH4, how many carbons? One. Each one weighs 12, right? That's just from the periodic table, 12.01. I'm just going to round it to 12, so that's going to be 12 grams. And then hydrogen, each one weighs one. So I got four of them, so that's going to be four grams. So when I add that up, that is the formula mass. There's 16 grams in one mole. If you see moles and grams, then you know that you're going to have to figure out what is the formula mass. So now that I know that, I can solve the first two with no problem. So I start off, put down what I've got. Three moles times in a line, what goes on the bottom? And this one, moles goes on the bottom, grams goes on top. Grams gets the 16, moles gets a 1. Mm -hmm. So 3 times 16 is 48. So 48 grams, am I done? What do I have to round this to? 50. Mm -hmm. So three has two significant figure, or sorry, one significant figure. I have two significant figures. So the four is the first one I keep, but the next number is an eight, so that's gonna round the four to a five. I do have to keep the zero. Remember zeros after, show you how big. So 48 rounds up to 50, keeping the zero at the end. Then the next one, so if I have 100 grams of CH4, how many moles of that? So I just have to take 100 grams, that's what I'm given, times in a line, what goes on the bottom this time? Grams, so you see the unit I'm given goes on the bottom. Moles, the unit I want, the answer is gonna go on the top. In front of moles, I put a 
one in front of grams, I put a 16. So now I gotta take 100 and divide it by 16. When I do that, Six point two five. That's moles. Can I keep that? One hundred has how many significant figures? Only one. So here's the first significant figure is a six. And my answer, remember, you just start from the left. The first significant figure is a six. So what happens to the two and the five? They get dropped. So this would just be equal to six moles. Okay, now when I go down to the next one, I see moles and molecules. So I know I don't use the formula mass. I'm just going to use Avogadro's number. So I wrote it up there. One mole of anything is 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. So I'm just going to take three moles because that's where I'm starting. Times in a line. What do I put on the bottom this time? Moles goes on the bottom because that's what I start with. Whatever you start with goes on the bottom in the first step. And then my answer goes on the top. There's like, do you forget that? Like a hair like floating right in front of your eyes. All right, so in front of molecules, I put mm -hmm. So molecules get 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. Moles gets a one. Mm -hmm. So in both of these, moles gets the one, grams gets the formula mass, mo molecules gets Avogadro's number. All right, so now when I do this, so 6 times, or sorry, 3 times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, and I got this, 1.806 times 10 to the 24th. Did anybody not get that? If you're not sure how to put it in the calculator, make sure that you see me after class just so I can walk you through it one more time. Did, can I keep those numbers? No. How many significant figures do I have to round to? Mm -hmm. So that's one significant figure. It's just three. So when I come across, remember, just start from the left. The one is the first significant figure. The next is an eight. So the one becomes a two. Mm -hmm. So this would be two times 10 to the 24th. I still keep those exponent numbers, but I do round the number out in front in scientific notation. Last one. So the last one's 1 1.3 times 10 to the 21st molecules. This is what I'm given times and a line. What unit do I put on the bottom? Molecules goes on the bottom. Whatever I'm given goes on the bottom, so it'll cancel. What goes on top, what I want to get is moles. What goes in front of moles? A one. Molecules gets the mm -hmm, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So now I will tell you if you're using a graphing calculator and you use those exponents, make sure you bracket things like you have to use parentheses. If you have a graphing calculator, you do. If you have the old calculator, you don't. Just use the EE button and it actually puts the parentheses in for you automatically. So 1.3 EE21 divided by 6.02 EE23. And I got, I'm trying to like, that's a two. 0.00215468. Did anybody not get that? If you didn't get that, it's just because of the way you put it in your calculator. So you got to practice. You got to make sure that, like, you can, if you divide exponents, you got to make sure that you know how to put it in your calculator. Can I keep all of those? Okay. How many do I have to round to? Two. Mm -hmm. So I need to have, because there's two here. I need to have two in my answer. So going across, remember those zeros out front are not significant, but I'm going to keep them because they show the size of the number. So the first two significant figures I get to is the two and the one. Next number is a five. So what happens to my one? It rounds up. Mm -hmm. So I end up with 0 0.0022 moles. Okay, go through and practice those ones. 
there's the last thing that I put up here is make sure that you complete the post lecture assignment in mastering the post lecture assignment for chapter three goes through all parts of chapter three. So there are some converting moles to molecules, molecules to moles, grams to moles, moles to grams, doing these. But this is kind of like, if you can remember this like upper corner part, recognizing if I see moles and grams, I gotta use the formula mass. If I see moles and molecules, I just use Avogadro's number. But I always wanna set it up. It's never more than just a single unit conversion to change from grams to moles or moles to molecules. It's never more than one step but use the unit so that you can see the unit I start with gets canceled by putting it down on the bottom. The unit I want and my answer goes on top when I set up the unit conversion. And that way you'll never multiply when you should divide or divide when you should have multiplied. So if you keep those units when you, before you like just take the time to write the steps out, then you'll end up like less likely to make a mistake. Okay, so that finishes three. So chapter four, goes on and looks more specifically at organic compounds. So when we talk about organic, people always think, oh, well, that means it doesn't have any pesticides or insecticides, no. <laughs> organic foods don't have any kind of those things added to them. But organic compounds are any compounds that contain carbon, okay, as a general rule. And typically, they are molecules that are almost entirely carbon and hydrogen. Now, if you remember back into the last chapter, when we talked about things that are carbon and hydrogen only, remember that means there's no nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine. So that is why these carbon and hydrogen share their covalent bonds very evenly, and that is why they are nonpolar. So hydrocarbons, these organic molecules, commonly do not mix with water if we're talking about just carbon and hydrogen. Good examples of these hydrocarbons are fuels, greases, waxes, oils, fats, lubricants, okay? Things that kind of like leave a residue on your hands so your hands feel greasy if you get any of them on you. And then even if you just rinse them in water, it doesn't come off because the grease is gonna stick to your skin because it's nonpolar. It doesn't want to mix with water. So in the body, we're going to have to deal with a nutrient group that includes fats and oils. Those as a nutrient group are called lipids. Lipids have this nonpolar characteristic. So lipids are things like your oils, like your vegetable oils, olive oil, peanut oil, canola oil, and then your fats. So fats, like they're typically from animal products, so fats like bacon grease, meat drippings, like the hamburger grease. So we'll talk about those and then how your body actually uses them to be able to build things like membranes and to build stuff like steroids. So like the sex hormones, those all are made from lipid components. The last interesting thing about hydrocarbons is that they're extremely exothermic. So your fuels, gasoline, very exothermic when it burns, releases a lot of heat. Exo means out of, thermo, think of heat. So this is heat generating, heat releasing. So this is why we use it to heat your house. So if you have a gas pack um, heater, some people have like propane heaters. Some people have ones that are that, you know, like if you live out in the country then or out in the county, you don't have like a gas line. So you have to use propane. If you live in the city, then you'll have like a gas line directly. That's methane. These are all those hydrocarbons. So remember that organic, mostly carbon, hydrogen, there to fulfill the octet for carbon, where carbon is typically making four bonds. Hydrogen is very commonly found. There are examples where there might be oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, even phosphorus that might be found in these organic molecules, but they're typically in very low numbers. So like you might have 100 carbons and only like three oxygens. Okay, so by and large, mostly carbon and hydrogen, but there might be some of those other atoms that are found. And these are what are used to bit make these big nutrient groups and building blocks for the body. They call them the biomolecules. It's really what biochemistry is really talking about. Our 
the chemistry of living organisms, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, or lipids. Those are the three that you think of as your nutrient molecules. So if you eat meat, you're getting protein. If you eat bread, you're getting carbohydrates. If you eat any kind of like butter, then you're getting those lipids or fats. But those are then used also as building blocks for your body, along with the nucleic acids. So DNA and RNA, the genetic information that's found inside of every nucleated cell. So we'll cover from kind of like after we get through this chapter, pretty much everything from this point forward starts really focusing on well, how are all of these things put together in the body. So this first section is actually learning how to draw, learning how to name and the why. And they're sort of interesting the way that organic molecules are typically drawn. And we are going to be talking more about just carbon and hydrogens. So you might see them written in a number of different ways. The one all the way at the very bottom, and sorry that they're so small, I'll redraw them. So the first one, they call that a molecular formula, right? That's just the formula, one carbon, four hydrogens. It doesn't tell you anything about how the molecule is drawn, how it's arranged. It's just the total number of atoms in the molecule, so CH4. But if you want to indicate the arrangement that the carbons have with the hydrogens, then you might use what's called the condensed structural formula. So this one that's written down here, well, and in fact, this one, this one is, they wrote C3H8. So that's three carbons, eight hydrogens. But again, when you look at a molecular formula, you really don't know how it's put together. You just have to start building it kind of from scratch. You have to start with a carbon because it needs the most bonds. You link another carbon because it needs the most bonds. You link a third carbon, and then you start putting the hydrogens on. But if you look at this condensed structural formula where it says CH3, CH2, CH3, and that's what's written down above that second formula, that actually tells you a little bit about how they're arranged. This means there is a carbon with three hydrogens attached that is linked to a carbon with two hydrogens attached, which is linked to a carbon with three hydrogens attached. So they can split it up and it shows you more the arrangement of the atoms around those carbons. You've done the Lewis structure. So the Lewis structure is where you use dashes for every single bond, just a single dash. So this one helps you to see how the condensed structural formula came about. So can you see this first carbon has three hydrogens attached? So see how this matches this? CH3, one carbon with three hydrogens attached. Then when you look at the middle carbon, it's got two hydrogens attached. Then you look at the far carbon and you see three hydrogens attached. So that condensed structure shows you the arrangement of things. The fourth one across, they call this a skeletal structure. Skeletal structure doesn't show you any of the carbons. It doesn't show you any of the hydrogens. It only indicates bonds between carbons. So if I look at this Lewis structure up here, do you see that there's one, two? There's only two bonds between carbons. All the other bonds are between carbon and hydrogen. So the skeletal structure would just be this. Like just a V or a, or a little peak. It's a straight line, straight line. Every corner and every end in a skeletal structure is a carbon. It's really nice when you have to do 10 carbons and you can just do this zigzag because then you don't have to write C, CH2, CH2, CH2 and put all of that in. Instead, you can just use this zigzag pattern in order to show the number of carbons in the molecule. One other thing you might remember about skeletal structures, skeletal structures will always have one less line than the number of carbons in the chain. So like this is three carbons, notice there's only two lines. So if I had five lines, then I know there's six carbons because there's one on either end and a carbon on every corner of the zigzag. Then the last one. So the last one's the ball and stick. So that tries to show you like three dimensional. There you might use, remember the wedge and dash that I showed you in the last one we were talking about geometry. 
So if something's sticking out, they might use a wedge to try and show that it's sticking out ahead of the board. They might use a dash to show that it's sticking behind. So that kind of tries to show a little more three-dimensional because it is kind of hard to think about the shape of a molecule when you're drawing it flat on a piece of paper. We don't really use skeletal structures until you start getting into like five and six carbons just because it looks really strange just looking like two lines. Okay, so if all of the bonds between carbons are all single bonds, then this is called an alkane. All single bond carbon to carbon connections in the molecule makes the ending of the molecule end in A-N-E. So all single bonds will always end in A and E. The other way, or the other term that they'll refer to it is if there's all single bonds, they will say that that carbon molecule is saturated. A saturated hydrocarbon is one that has all single bonds. So saturated A and E all tell you there's no double bonds, there's no triple bonds in the molecule or between the carbons, they're all single. And those are really the ones we're gonna name. This chapter is kind of a, a challenge because organic chemistry is a two semester class and we're gonna cover it in, in one chapter. So there is like a much abbreviated explanation of things as they go through. So just know that, like, if you think this chapter is really cool, well, you could take an organic chemistry class, but it's a two semester class. The other way they go about naming. So if all the bonds between carbons are single, it always ends in A-N-E. But they also name it according to the number of carbons in the molecule. So if there is only one carbon in the molecule, then they use the term meth. So if there's only one carbon, you're going to use meth. All single bonds, it ends in A and E. So that would be methane. So CH4, its common name, or they call it the IUPAC name. So it's like these, these chemists got together and agreed that this was the naming for organic molecules. So methane's always a single carbon. Now, if you have two carbons that are connected, no other carbons in the molecule, just those two, then that has the beginning of F. If it's all single bonds, it ends in A and E. So we have methane, then there's ethane. So meth, remember, is one, F is two. Those ones are weird. Those ones don't really fit anything you've ever heard before. So those are ones just to like practice and commit to memory. Same thing with three. Like most people are like, well, why don't they use try or something like that? But they already use that in number prefixes. So instead, they went to three carbons in a chain with all single bonds. That would be propane. So prop is the short version. It means three carbons in the chain. Meth means one. F means two. Prop means three. The last one that's odd is four. If you have four, then they use the prefix of but. If they're all single bonds, it's butane. So methane, I told you, is natural gas. Propane, where do you have propane? Yeah, in your little propane tank, like for your gas grill. So these are fuels. Butane, where's butane? Butane is in a, the little Bic lighter. Those are butane lighters. So three out of the four of these are common fuels because they're really small. They're gases at room temperature or may become gas very easily. So they're really good to be used as a fuel source because we can compress them. Methane, ethane, propane, butane. So it's sort of like you just have to sort of say them. Meth is just one carbons, eth is two carbons, prop is three carbons, bute is four. Once we go past there, now they just fall back into the normal geometry stuff, right? So then it becomes more familiar because when you think of pent, you think of five, like a pentagon, right? So pentane means this is a chain of five carbons. Hex is six, hept is seven, oct is eight, known is nine, and then dec would be 10. 
So once we go past four, they really just fall back into the naming like a geometric shape. So I think they're a lot more familiar. It's really those one through four carbons that people are like, it's hard to remember them because they sort of, they don't follow most of your counting numbers. So if this is a chain, so if I just have CH3, CH2, CH2, CH3, then you would call that what? You just call it butane. You would just count the number of carbons in the chain and you would say there's four carbons in this chain, so this is butane. Okay? Notice with that skeletal structure, notice like with decane, see how easy that is to like draw the zigzag? <laughs> So remember, decane would be 10, and if you counted the lines, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So notice that there's one less line than numbers of carbon. So if you ever had to draw, like if I wanted to draw hexane, and I wanted to do a skeletal structure for hexane, I would just go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. I would just put five lines, and that is because with hexane, come on. This would be one carbon, two carbon, three carbon, four carbon, five carbon, six carbon. So every end and every corner of the zigzag is a carbon. It doesn't show the hydrogens, but you have to know hydrogens have to be there because carbon always forms how many bonds? Four, right? So the end carbons are always going to be CH3. The middle carbons will always be CH2 because they have one to each carbon on either end, but then there's always going to be two hydrogens there as well. So you can kind of see that in the con condensed structures. The end carbons are CH3s, the middle carbons are CH2s, because carbon always has four bonds. Okay, so that's just how you name the chain. There's their examples. So like, look, like isooctane is a component in gasoline. Isooctane is nothing but carbons and hydrogen. Diesel fuel is hexadecane, that's 16 carbons. Candle wax, 31 carbons in a long chain. They even had to bend it so that they could put it on the paper. <laughs> like that's literally why they folded it in half that way, was so that it would actually fit because otherwise they'd have to shrink it down super tiny, okay? So all of those waxes, oils, greases, mostly just carbon and hydrogen, share their covalent bonds very evenly, make very neutral molecules that don't mix with water. So remember all of these are your nonpolar fuels. Sometimes though, they form a ring. Now, I will tell you, you don't see these in nature. <laughs> They're not very stable, but the other two you really do. Cyclopentane, cyclopentane means a ring of pent is five. Cyclo is the way that you know that it forms a ring. And then the name that comes after the cyclo tells you how many carbons in the ring. Cyclopentane just tells me that this is a ring of five. Cyclohexane is a ring of six because of hex. These two are the more common ones. You can have cyclooctane, which would be a ring of eight. Mm -hmm. But that's pretty much it. Five, six, and eight, those are more common. And the reason propane and butane don't really do this is because of the carbon bonds. Carbon to carbon bonds, remember that 100 and, um, 109.5 is the optimal angle. So in these, I'd have to make them into like a 60 degree angle and a 90 degree angle. And carbon to carbon bonds don't like to have to bend that much. So they can form a more comfortable ring of five, six, eight than they can getting squashed into a ring of three or four. So you really don't see cyclopropane or cyclobutane very much. They're not naturally found. So what if I have this CH3, CH2, CH, CH3, and I have a branch. So when I look at this, I see, okay, there's five carbons on this, right? So if you count one, two, three, four, there's five carbons on this, but they're not in a straight chain. So this is pretty common with organic molecules. Is there's not just a single chain. It has things that are attached to a chain. They can have 
carbons, there could be oxygens, nitrogens. We're really not going to worry about naming those ones. We'll look at identifying them. But then with this one that's hanging down, I want to name this so that I would be able to identify it and actually be able to draw it. So the rules that they came up with, and these are the people that did this, so don't look at me. I didn't make these rules, okay? But the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. So the chemists all got together and said, how do we name things so that they're uniform? So that every single time you look at a molecule, you can name it and be able to draw it based on that name or be able to identify it based on its drawing. Like sort of like we were doing with naming and drawing with covalent and ionic compounds in chapter three, but the same thing here. So there's a couple of rules. The first thing you always have to do is you have to find the longest carbon chain. So when I look at this, I gotta find the longest carbon chain. What is the longest chain of carbons in this molecule? How many? Four. So that means that this is a, what's four? Four carbons is butane, okay? Sign the longest carbon chain. I always circle it because if I circle it, then I know that it's the longest carbon chain and then I just identify the things that aren't part of the circle. So then I can name things that aren't part of that longest chain. The longest carbon chain, do you see that we could do this? One, two, three, four. Would it be okay if we did this? Is that still four? Yeah, and it wouldn't change your number. It wouldn't change your answer. They would still be exactly the same. Longest carbon chain. So I'm going to say this is a butane. This becomes like the last name, okay? So it's the last name now of this molecule. The only other thing I have to identify is I have to identify anything that's not hydrogen that's hanging off the chain. So that has to be, I don't care about the hydrogens. I don't have to name the hydrogens, thank God. I don't have to name all the hydrogens. I just have to name anything that's not hydrogen that's hanging off. So what's one thing that's hanging off of this chain that's not enclosed in the circle is that CH3 group, right? And so what I do is I circle it, okay? I circle this non-hydrogen group. So when it's one carbon, what was its name? Methane, okay? So if it's a group hanging, instead of saying methane, because that makes you think of a single, a single CH4, this, a CH3 group that's hanging off, they call this a meth, oh, they use a YL, and they still use meth because it's one carbon, but instead of A-N-E, because it's attached to a chain, they use the YL. So this is methyl This is methyl butane. So this like the name of the non-hydrogen hanging group goes in front. Third thing that I have to do, and then I'm done, the third thing that I have to do is I have to indicate which carbon in the chain does this methyl group hang off of. So do I want to number my chain from the left or the right? The rule is, is I always want to list the lowest possible number. So in this, I could say this is carbon one, two, three, and four. And if that's the case, I would say that this would be 3-methyl because it's the methyl group is hanging off of carbon 3 in the chain. So I'm just counting the carbons in the chain because I have to indicate where that methyl group is hanging off. But if I number from the other side, what would that give me? Mm -hmm. Then I would have a 2. So let's, if I went backwards and said, okay, well, if I call that carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, do you see that that would give me a 2-methyl? That number that goes in front of methyl just is telling me where on the carbon chain it's attached. And I would pick that one because that's a lower number. So you just number from the left or the right. Always just number from the end. Whichever end you get to the hanging group first, that's the right side to number it from. 
So if I numbered from the left, this would be 3-methyl. If I number from the right, it would be 2-methyl. So that's why I'd want to number from the right to give it the lowest possible numbering. So the third thing to do is I numbered the longest chain and always start from the side where the non-hydrogen group is. Because if you have a chain, you've always got a choice. You number from one side or the other side, okay? But the rule is, is I always want to make my non-hydrogen groups have the lowest possible number. So you can like, I, I just start from each end and go in and go in until I get to a hanging group. And then I know whichever side that is, that's the side I'm going to number from. Because that will always give me the lowest possible number combination. Sometimes it doesn't <laughs> matter. But if, it, if you come like this one, it does. Okay, so let's do a couple of them. Here's always the steps. So this is something that you can go back and like look at. One, find the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms. And I always give you this hint, count from every end. So sometimes it doesn't have to be in a straight line. So you could have a chain go down and across and back up, okay? So it's not necessarily at the longest carbon chain in a straight line because carbon atoms have this ability to twist and rotate. So they're not necessarily always in a straight chain, but you want to find the longest chain and you're going to, that becomes the last name of my molecule. So that always goes at the end, okay? Whether it's a five carbon chain, then it's pentane, or if it's a seven carbon chain, then it's heptane. Then I want to identify groups that are hanging off. And I will tell you, these are the only ones, and honestly, we don't use propyl very much. These are the only ones that we are going to worry with. If there's just a single carbon, a CH3 hanging off, that is a methyl. You just use a YL because meth means one carbon, YL because it's a hanging group. Two carbons hanging off, so it would have to be a CH2, CH3. Two carbons hanging off as a single chain is an ethyl. Three carbons hanging off would be a propyl. Almost never do that, okay? The other one that we also threw in are the halogens, because remember that the halogens only ever form a single bond, right? Fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, they're in group seven. They form a single covalent bond, so they're super easy to name, because if there's a fluorine, one fluorine is called a fluoro, so you just use the first part and have O. One chlorine becomes a chloro. One bromine, or a bromine hanging off, becomes a bromo, and iodine becomes an iodo. So you just use the first part of the halogen's name, group seven, and just add an O, and that's how you indicate that they are present on the chain. Third thing, number the longest chain, starting from the end closest to that hanging group, the non-hydrogen hanging group. If you have more than one non-hydrogen hanging group, you always list them alphabetically, which is fun, sometimes fun, but you're, you're good to, We'll practice them so they'll get a little bit easier. If there's a bunch of hanging groups and you're trying to do this in mastering, they'd like you to use dashes between numbers and words. They like you to use commas if you have multiple numbers in a row. We'll practice those. I don't care. <laughs> you don't have to put dashes for me, okay? You don't have to put commas. If you just put the numbers and you put your, your non-hydrogen groups in the parent name, we're all good with that. Okay, so let's do this one. So here, because this is the biggest pain in the neck, and I always end up deleting these, I'm just going to say all of these are hydrogen. Stop that. Go away. Hydrogen, hydrogen. All right, so remember all these dashes are hydrogen. Carbon has to have four covalent bonds. This is an alkane because it's all single bonds. So I want you to look at it. There is six carbons across off of the next to the last carbon. There's the carbon sticking up. Off of the third carbon, there's two carbons hanging down. What's the longest carbon chain? What do you see? Six? Anybody see more than that? No. So six. Six it is. Okay. So you could go straight across. Do you see that? 
one, two, three, four, five, six. That would be fine. But I could also go this. Everybody see that? Okay. So the only rule in drawing or finding your longest carbon chain is you want to make sure that your non-hydrogen groups are attached to it. So this, somebody said, well, what about this? Would that be right? Why? It's not the longest chain. There's only how many in that? Five. So you got to find the longest. So that's why I say start from every end. Start from every end and like kind of like follow along. Good. Make sure you do corners as well. Okay. So we'll say with this one, we'll just do that just because straight's always the easiest. <laughs> okay. So if there's six, what is the parent name for this? Six carbons is hexane. Okay. So that's the first step. Find the longest carbon chain, circle it. That's now the very last name or very last word in the name of this molecule. Now two, find the groups that are not hydrogen that are hanging off. So that would be anybody? Okay, so there's a single carbon sticking up here. That's a CH3. A single carbon is called a methyl, right? Now, hanging down here, that's not part of the chain. That is a ethyl. Do you see the difference between the two? That one's a CH2, CH3, two carbons hanging off of my chain. So one's a methyl, one's an ethyl. So that's step two. Do you see all the rest are hydrogen? So I don't have to worry about any others. It's only things that are not hydrogen hanging off the chain. Next, I got a number. Do I number from the left or the right or does it matter? So you're looking at the green chain and you start counting in which side has the first hanging group. So the left, this would be one, two, three. If I start from the right, it would be two on carbon two. Does everybody see that? So look, this is carbon one, two, three. That would make a three ethyl. If I started from the right, it'd be one, two. So that would be a two methyl. That is how I know that I need to start from here. One, two, three, four, five, six. All I'm doing is numbering the chain. Now I know my methyl, what number does it get? It gets a two because it's hanging off a of carbon number two and my ethyl gets a, a four because it's hanging off of carbon number four. So the number in front just tells me where that group is attached to the chain. Then the last thing, I have to name these since there's more than one, I have to list them alphabetically. So which one do I write first? Ethyl or methyl? Ethyl gets written first. So four, ethyl, two, methyl, hexane. I just list them, the number in front of the ethyl tells me which carbon it's on. The number in front of the methyl tells me which carbon it's on. The number at the end tells me the longest carbon chain. Okay, we will pick up and work on these because we've got like, I have like lots. <laughs> so there's lots, plenty to practice with. So we will do all of these ones on Thursday.